We're now going to move on to the final talk in the main session, which is by Professor Murray Shanahan, who's at Imperial College. He's a professor of robotics, but he's also recently produced a book on the technological singularity, which is a, a careful study of some of the challenges, questions about the rise of ever smarter software, ever smarter artificial intelligence. And we're going to hear from uh, Professor Shanahan about the future of artificial intelligence. So, welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, so, first of all, I just uh, want to uh, say that Anders, in his uh, previous talk, said that no talk about the future uh, that's any good uh, fails to mention blockchain, and uh, Anders is always right, so now I've got that out of the way. So. Um, okay, <clears throat> um, how do I move on? Okay, so really, the talk that I want to give you today is, is divided pretty cleanly into two halves. And I think it's quite important to make this distinction between these two halves. The two halves are short-term implications of artificial intelligence and long-term implications of artificial intelligence. Because, and when I say short-term, I mean 10 years, 20 years or so. And when I say long-term, I mean 100 years or, or more. Um, and, uh, and the thing is that we know a great deal more. We have a much better idea about how... AI is going to impact on the economy and on society over the, the next 10 years or so than we do how it's going to impact on society in the, in the longer term. But I think it's very important to think about both timescales, and it's also important to distinguish between the two. So this is sort of roughly what the talk is going to look like. I'm going to talk about near future stuff and near term implications. And then I'm going to talk about human level AI and longer term implications. Okay. Um, so first of all, AI today. Well, um, there's a big audience here. You know, this is very impressive. And this is a sign of the fact that there is a great deal of current interest in artificial intelligence technology. Um, and uh, it's interesting looking at the history of this because AI tends to go, uh, interest in AI tends to go in cycles. There have been a number of cycles of hype followed by disappointment, and then hype followed by disappointment. Um, so these are sometimes called, so, so when we get the disappointment, uh, this is sometimes called an, an AI winter. And over the past few decades, we've experienced several of these AI winters. So for example, in the late 1980s uh, and early 90s, after a great deal of enthusiasm about expert systems and, uh, and that kind of technology, and everybody thought that that was going to lead to enormous uh, economic uh, impact and have a, have a great uh, uh, lead to great change, and, and, and we'd soon have human-level AI, but it never really kind of materialized, and that was followed by a period of, of, of disappointment, an AI winter. But just lately, AI has been getting a great deal of attention again, so we seem to be in a new AI spring. So the interesting question is, is there something different about things this time? So signs of, uh, of, uh, of, of this possible new, or, or this new AI spring are things like uh, interest in the, uh, the media. So maybe some of you have seen all these films. So a lot of films about AI have been out lately, like Age of Ultron, Her and Transcendence, and, uh, and Ex Machina, which is the one you must all see, because I was the scientific advisor on it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then there's also been a great deal of interest in uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, within the media. And I'm sure that you've all heard these quotes before, but um, so Stephen Hawking said, uh, <clears throat> I think it was about a year ago now, success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last unless we learn how to avoid the risks. So pretty scary stuff from Stephen Hawking. And then Elon Musk um, said around the same time, I hope we're not just the biological bootloader for digital superintelligence. That's a kind of cooler way of putting it, I think, from a geek point of view. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that is increasingly uh, probable. Now, these sorts of quotes gained a great deal of attention in the media. They sound very scary. They're great clickbait. They make for terrific headlines. And, uh, uh, and the media you know, had an absolute feast uh, turning this into a very alarmist message. So I'm interested in, in going over a little bit, you know, how scared should we really be? 
And then there's been a great deal of investment in artificial intelligence recently. So uh, it's now, uh, I think it was the beginning of 2014, so it's, oh, it's pretty old news now, but Google bought uh, the London-based AI company DeepMind for about uh, 400 million pounds. They also, just prior to that, bought six robotics companies, including Boston Dynamics, who make these uh, amazing walking robot platforms uh, that were very well known within robotics before Google bought out the company. Uh, and then Facebook and Baidu set up AI labs and started hiring a, uh, machine learning gurus. And recently, Toyota has set up a very large AI lab in Silicon Valley. So there's, uh, there's an enormous amount of I commercial interest. And here are a couple of, um, a couple of quotes from reliable financial sources about how uh, much kind of growth and impact there's going to be in, the, in these areas. So according to a, a McKinsey report, which was published in 2013, overall, we estimate the potential economic impact of knowledge automation tools in the types of work that we assessed in this report could reach 5.2 trillion to 6.7 trillion. Five, not 5.3 trillion to 6.0, no, 5.2 trillion to 6. Very precise bounds they've put on this. Um, uh, per year, by 2025, due to great uh, output per knowledge worker. Now, by 2015, it's very hard to know what... Well, I, mean, I haven't read the report in great detail, so I don't know exactly the methodology they used or the, the terms that they used, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the way they defined these terms, but, but things seems to, there seems to have been some inflation in the last couple of years because... A report that was just published just last week by uh, Bank of Ameri America Merrill Lynch. So uh, they talk about um, a uh, robotics and AI market that will grow to 153 billion uh, US dollars by 2020. Um, uh, but they, when they talk about the uh, annual creative dis disruptive impact in 10 years at the same time, and they seem to be talking about knowledge workers as well in, in, if, when you look at the report, well, they reckon that the, they anticipate 14 to 33 trillion uh, dollars. Well, OK, so that's, that's quite a lot of inflation in two years if they're talking about the same thing. Well, of course, we don't know exactly what they're talking about. I'm not an economist, but one thing I do know, these are very big numbers. OK, so people are getting very... So if you're, you know, if you're doing almost anything in business, you're going to be paying attention to these kinds of reports and you're going to be thinking... You know, we need to get into artificial intelligence. Um, okay, so now, so what, so, you know, what's the reality of this, this, of this kind of thing? Or rather, what is, what underpins all of this uh, sort of enthusiasm? Um, and uh, so what underpins it are a, a number of, of factors. So there has certainly, there's certainly been some successes in a number of subfields of, of artificial intelligence research broadly construed. And the two most prominent subfields uh, are machine learning and, uh, and computer vision. And if this was a longer talk, I could go into some of the particular achievements that have been made within those two, two fields. But there isn't great uh, time to do that, so you just kind of have to take my word for it. Many of you will be familiar with some of those achievements within things like image captioning and, uh, uh, and uh, computer vision for robotics and so on. Uh, so there's been some, some significant progress within those fields. And that progress is actually uh, has been driven by, to, some, to a large extent, by what we see in the next two bullet points. Um, so that progress has been driven by the uh, increased computing power that is available to, uh, to, to, research, uh, to researchers. So uh, perhaps you're, I'm sure you're, you know, we're in the, the, the London Futurist Meetup, so you all know about exponential change and things like Moore's Law. So Moore's Law... Um, has, uh, has driven the increase in computing power that's available to AI researchers, and in particular, the use, increasing use of GPUs or graphics processing units, which was something that I would not have seen coming if you'd asked me about it uh, 15 years ago, the idea that it's basically um, the sort of marketing or the market uh, power of gamers, you know, in their bedrooms who can want a better and better gaming experience and, a, you know, better resolution graphics and faster uh, stuff, that is what's going to drive the development of these graphics processing units, which can in turn be used for, uh, for general purpose computing if the type of computing that you want to do is very, very easily parallelized, which in the case of image processing and, and certain kinds of machine learning, it is. So the availability of all of this extra computing power 
largely thanks to GPUs, has really pushed machine learning uh, forwards. At the same time, um, the availability of very large data sets to throw at these machine learning algorithms, that is also that's the second factor that's enabled a great deal of progress uh, within, uh, within the field of machine learning. So, that, so those are two factors. And then the third factor is that there have indeed, I haven't got a, got a bullet point there, but, but there have indeed been a number of, uh, of, of uh, engineering tweaks and, and improvements and, and little mini breakthroughs in the kinds of machine learning algorithms that people have used. So those three things, some, some engineering uh, um, improvements, uh, big data sets, and a lot of computing power have combined to, to bring about some, some quite dramatic successes in, in machine learning, and especially when, when applied to, uh, to vision. Um, then, in addition, we have a num number of other things that are driving, uh, uh, driving the current sort of enthusiasm. So there's the prospect of the Internet of Things, of uh, a very much larger number of, of, uh, of everyday objects and, and, and artifacts that we find in our ordinary lives and in the cities and in our homes are becoming Internet-enabled, which uh, is going to contribute to the provision of very large data sets to these AI algorithms. And, and that's just going, going further in enabling uh, them to pick out complex patterns and make better and better uh, decisions. So, of course, this, this all leads to things like the significant corporate investment that we're seeing, the purchase of, of DeepMind and so on, and a very buoyant uh, startup scene. Um, looking for the time. Oh, is the time up there? Right. When did we start? Um, do you <laughs> 20 minutes more, right, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so just to give you an example of, um, of one of the recent successes, this is, so Google, why did uh, uh, Google buy uh, DeepMind? Well, this was one of the, the uh, uh, main demos that they, uh, that they presented. Uh, this is uh, DQN, uh, uh, that's the name of the little system, and, Go and Google DeepMind's, or DeepMind's DQN, what it does is it learns to play a suite of these retro Atari games like, uh, like Space Invaders. And uh, you might not think that that's terribly Im impressive, but it is very impressive because all that the, uh, the system takes as input is just the raw pixels on the screen and the score, so it actually is given the score directly rather than having to interpret it on the screen. So it's given the score, and it's given the raw pixels on the screen, and it just has to use a, a technique called reinforcement learning combined with some of those uh, lear machine learning techniques that have recently become uh, uh, very successful. So a combination of reinforcement learning, which is a kind of trial, uh, uh, trial and error learning, whereby it just plays zillions and zillions of games and, and it is constantly getting a reward signal of how well it's doing score-wise, and it plays many, 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 many games, and just based on purely on this pixel input, it gets better and better at the game. And eventually, for a large collection of games, it actually attains superhuman capability in the sense that it beats even the best human players at certain games. And the s significant thing about it is that you can, you can throw a completely new game at it, and it will start from scratch, and it will learn that new game without knowing anything about the game, and will get to a certain uh, skill level at that game. Now, there are some games that it's better at learning than others. It's not terribly good at Pac-Man, um, uh, for example, uh, because there are certain features of that game that make it difficult to learn with this trial and error method, but it's very good at Space Invaders and, and, and various, uh, various other uh, games. Now, the reason why this is interesting is not because uh, you, know, you can take DQN and then, uh, and then use it uh, you know, in some commercial setting and make a load of money, but it's because the type of technology that it represents uh, is, is indeed uh, has tremendous commercial potential because it's a step towards a kind of general generic learning uh, um, algorithm. Okay. Now, so I want to now make this very important distinction between short-term and long-term uh, implications of, of AI technology. So, the, so to, and I'm going to do that, but first of all, we're giving you examples of the kind of thing which, the kind of applications of AI technology which we are going to see in the, in the short term, things that are sure to happen over, the, over a sort of a 10-year time frame. And many of these are things that you'll have, 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 been, have seen 
being talked about a great deal in the media. For example, self-driving cars. We've all been reading about the Google self-driving car. I read just this morning that the uh, uh, Google self-driving car, uh, one of the Google self-driving cars in California, had, had apparently been, been uh, pulled over for curb crawling. <laughs> and, uh, so, and, uh, I mean, this is because, because uh, I mean, I didn't actually read any more than the headline, right? But I can piece together what went on because, it's because the self, these self-driving cars are extremely cautious in their driving. So if, if, there's, if, the, if the, uh, the, the computer has any doubt about what speed it can go at or what might be in its environment nearby, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really go very, very slowly. So, so you can imagine that some policeman is looking at this dodgy car and thinking, right, pull, 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 pull them over. Uh, well, you know, uh, would have had a big Google sign on it, but I mean. Um, okay, so intelligent robotics, for example, in, in, in factories, the kinds of robotics we're used to seeing in factories for, uh, for decades are the, are the sorts of things that, uh, that manufacture, say, cars. But those kinds of robots have to do a very carefully uh, choreographed sequence of movements that rely on all the components they need being in, being in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. But there's going to be a new generation of, of uh, robots that are usable in, the fa in factory settings which have a lot more intelligence and are capable of adapting to a much wider set of circumstances. So they won't, it, you won't have to engineer a production line so that it's you know, precisely engineered to put all of the components in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. Uh, but but, but we'll, you'll have something that is approximates uh, you know, the intelligence of a, of a human factory worker a little bit, a little bit more. Personal assistance, I think, is an, an area that's going to be hugely significant. So we've all tried things like Siri and Cortana and so on, and, uh, uh, and you may find them more or less useful or more or less convincing, but I think that this is an area, speech recognition as a, as a challenge has pretty much been cracked, I think. They, these, uh, uh, these systems have very, very good speech recognition capabilities now, the kind of thing that we could only have dreamt of uh, uh, sort of 10 or 15 years ago. Um, what we're going to certainly see as time goes on is a more convincing user experience, a more convincing um, uh, sort of uh, feeling that there is uh, an in something intelligent there that can actually help us out with stuff, rather than there being something uh, there that can actually uh, just you know transcribe the words, but then then reacts to them in a rather dumb way, which it often which they often do. But I think this is an area which is a, going to be a huge uh, growth area. And then there are many others. Scientific uh, discovery. So medicine is an, an area where, uh, which is, so this very much relates to, uh, to Anders' uh, talk. So, so medicine is one area where you have very, very complex um, uh, uh, and, and large quantities of data that are very, very complex. And especially if you want to take into account uh, the latest scientific research, vast numbers of clinical trials that may be carried out on all kinds of different drugs. You also want to, and, and so nowadays it's hard for, uh, even an expert within a particular field of medicine to keep abreast of the latest developments within that field because journal articles are coming out all the time. So how, you know, how can a GP hope to be up to date on all the latest uh, research when, they, when a, a patient presents uh, with some particular complex of symptoms to them? Moreover, we're, getting, we're moving into a, a, an era of increasingly personalized medicine where people's uh, genomes are going to be... Um, uh, uh, all be sort of sequenced, a lot of uh, data about their lifestyle and their diet and their exercise regime is all going to be available that's personalized to them. Combine those two things together, the personalized uh, data plus the uh, um, uh, vast uh, repertory of scientific discovery that's, that's coming online, and you, want, you really need an assistant uh, 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 to try and you know, put all these things together to give the best possible diagnosis and treatment for a particular patient that, that, uh, that, that arrives in, um, uh, uh, you know, in the GP's clinic in the morning. And uh, so that's another area where AI is, no, is undoubtedly going to be of enormous uh, benefit. So corporate decision making and, uh, and indeed political decision making, it's the kind of thing that Anders talked about extensively just now. Uh, autonomous weapons as well, and uh, I, I'm not going to go into that in any detail at all. So in all of these areas, those in, uh, bits of enabling AI technology that I spoke about on the previous couple of slides, machine learning in particular, um, are going to have a great impact and, 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 and produce all kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, effects. And that's why there is some justification 
to, the, uh, um, uh, to those projections of the economic impact that these, these things are going to have. Now, none of that is anything to do, or is not much to do with, those alarmist pronouncements by people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking. And that's because when Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking are talking about artificial intelligence, they're not talking about these kinds of AI tools that are going to have this short-term impact. They're talking about human-level artificial intelligence, the kind of thing that we see in science fiction films. So when you, if you, if, as I hope you all have, seen Ex Machina, um, uh, or, or, or other not quite so good science fiction films that feature artificial <laughs> intelligence, then, then nearly always what you see is, uh, is, is human-level AI. So Ava in Ex Machina undoubtedly has a kind of human-level uh, intelligence. And um, uh, uh, so this is what we're kind of used to. We, and and uh, the sort of public perception of AI is that that's what it is. It's this kind of thing that we see in the science fiction films. But the fact is that we don't know how to make human-level artificial intelligence yet. All of this stuff is not human-level AI. These are particular specialist tools and specialist enabling technology. It's going to have a big impact, but it's not human-level AI. Human-level AI, and the important difference between these, between these two things, is that human-level AI is, is uh, general. Is, so, so we're talking here about general intelligence. Well, it's, that's why it's sometimes called AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence. So the important distinction here is that... Um, OK, so we have a slide, I believe, for this. Uh, oh, uh, well, OK, yes, I do have a slide for that. I, uh, so I'm going I'm to come back to this issue of general versus specialist uh, intelligence in a second. But I just wanted to... I've just got a couple of slides, but in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll gloss over these a little bit, about... Some of the short term, so in addition to all of the excitement about investment and, 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 and all of the positive uh, impacts that I'm very confident this kind of technology will have on, on society, but there are also some, some issues. And one issue is technological unemployment. So, um, uh, and in fact, that's, you know, again, is the kind of thing that deserves the whole talk all to itself because I don't think we really know how this is going to pan out uh, economically. So, uh, so, of course, since the Industrial Revolution, um, we've had many examples of jobs that have disappeared thanks to automation. You know, we don't need uh, as many um, uh, people who are expert, you know, horsemen or women. Um, uh, it, would, it would have been horsemen, right, <laughs> in those days anymore. And cars sort of more or less got rid of that kind of uh, job altogether. But, of course, many other kinds of jobs arose to replace those sorts of jobs. So, so the, this is a sort of truism uh, of... of, of, of uh, of history and, uh, and economics that, uh, that the jobs that have been lost have been replaced by whole new types of, of job. And indeed, nobody 10, uh, well, 10, 20 years ago, certainly, nobody knew that there would ever be such a career as web designer, you know, or computer games designer. Well, maybe they could just about conceive about, of that 20 years ago, but only just. What about professional gamer? Whoa, I mean, that's, that's definitely, uh, nobody could have thought of that 20 years ago for sure. Uh, or professional YouTube content provider, you know, the teenager in their bedroom who can make a significant sum of money just by putting up videos of them putting makeup on and stuff like that. I mean, nobody would have thought that that was possible. I can still hardly believe it. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, it is, right? <clears throat> so, so new kinds of jobs arise to replace those that are lost. But the interesting question is, could things be different this time? So... It, could it be the case that because AI is essentially replacing... So, so it, there's a sense in which, uh, in which you, the, the jobs that are lost are replaced with ones that require perhaps more education, they're more kind of knowledge-type jobs. Um, but what's happening now is that because it's AI, we're kind of squeezing that little, uh, little sort of region of jobs that can be uh, done by humans with their distinctive cognitive skills. So... Of course, uh, as time goes, goes by, you know, we'll, it may be that, that, that those professions that require uh, more and more kind of creativity are going to survive longest, and certainly those that require a distinctively human touch, like the caring professions, are going to survive along, well, survive perhaps indefinitely. But it may not be the same dynamic as uh, we've seen post the Industrial Re Revolution. So that's certainly a, uh, an, an issue. And then there's a whole other issue uh, on to do with technological dependence, which is also of, of 
uh, you know, of considerable interest. But I won't go into that because I want to talk instead about this long -term, uh, these long-term issues. So just to summarize, so uh, this is my concluding kind of uh, Q&A for, for, for part one to do with the short-term uh, implications. Um, so, so is the current interest in AI misguided? Well, no, I don't think it is because there has been notable progress, genuine progress in, uh, in the field of AI that I think will translate into applications. And the fact that there's so much commercial and industrial investment in this is, uh, well, of course, there can be bubbles, but I think it's a good, kind of a good sign that there is so much investment uh, in this. There's hard cash going into this um, uh, area, and that's sort of uh, a sign that maybe there's more there than just uh, academics talking this stuff up. Um, so what are the benefits? Well, it's really the ability to find hidden patterns in large quantities of complex data. So that's going to benefit science, commerce, industry, government, the consumer. So there are a great many uh, benefits uh, there. And are there any downsides? Well, yes, potentially there certainly are. Things like technological unemployment, I really, really don't know quite where that's going. And te technological dependency, I had a whole slide on that, but I left it out because I want to move on to, to, to the sort of next topic. So what about the longer term stuff, though? So what about the, so the, what about, what about the science fiction uh, uh, picture of human level AI? So are we ever going to get there and how long will it take and so on? So, um, so here I want to just kind of clarify this specialist uh, distinction between specialist AI and, and general AI. And I want you to consider Gary Kasparov. Uh, Gary Kasparov was the world chess champion in 1997 when there was this significant AI landmark where Deep Blue computer uh, beat Gary Kasparov, I think three games to two in this, uh, in this um, you know, uh, amazing sort of computer versus human championship. So the world chess champion, champion was, uh, 1987 was beaten by, uh, by a computer. But the amazing thing about Gary Kasparov is not really that he can play terrific chess. It's that he can play terrific chess while also being able to hold a decent conversation and change a light bulb. And well, I'm not sure that he can necessarily write a computer program, but in general, human beings can learn to do an enormous variety of, of different things. In fact, we can invent whole new things. Um, so writing computer programs was not something that anybody knew about 100 years ago, except uh, Ava Lovelace. And um, uh, so, so it's a whole new uh, kind of thing. So we can invent you know, whole new, a whole new kind of creative, uh, um, creative domains like YouTube content provider. And so that's the, the incredible thing about, uh, uh, about humans is that we, we have this general capability to do an enormous variety of tasks, to learn new tasks, and indeed to invent new tasks. Um, and so to do that requires, this, requires artificial general intelligence. Now, what are the barriers to, uh, to doing this? And this is my, one of my favorite uh, Larson cartoons. And for those who can't see the, uh, uh, the caption, it says, early experiments in transportation. Um, this is the, uh, the caption. Whoa, how did that happen? That's the AIs messing with us. Don't do that to me. I won't do it by magic. Yeah. Um, and this very nicely illustrates, I mean, why do we laugh at this, right? We laugh at this because, because we would never do this, right? And, um, uh, but it also, illustrates, it also illustrates the fact that we do try out creative stuff. You know, let's try out new kinds of things. So, so it illustrates a number of, 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 of things. Uh, so so th I think there are a number of obstacles conceptual obstacles that we in the field of artificial intelligence, we don't know how to overcome these obstacles yet in order to create this kind of human level artificial general intelligence that we see in science fiction films. And the two that I, uh, two that I often cite are creativity and, and common sense. And what I mean by common sense is the ability to predict uh, the consequences of everyday actions, um, whether it's the social consequences or the physical consequences. And, uh, and I often illustrate this by asking people to imagine what would happen if I lifted something like, there's always something around that I can use to illustrate this. So imagine that I lift, took this table and I kind of lifted it up like that and sort of hurled it in this direction, right? Well, it's got all this stuff on it. This bottle is open. You can, you know, you can just imagine all these obstacles flying all over the place. It would cause 
terrible injury to these people in the front row. Uh, people a bit further back would also be annoyed because they'd get slightly wet. You know, you can imagine all of this, right? And, you know, somebody would have to call the police. People would be very angry. They, I'd be thought of as a total nutter, you know, and carted off. But, but so you can, you've never, ima presumably, never imagined a situation quite like that before, unless you've heard one of my recent talks where I used the same example. Um, and, uh, but, but nevertheless, you straight away could imagine all of those consequences and see why that would be a pretty bad idea, right? And um, uh, so, so that's what I mean by, by, by common sense, the ability to, to anticipate you know, how the everyday world works, really. And it also requires this, this general intelligence, also requires creativity, so the, the ceaseless the uh, sort of tendency to try out new stuff, um, but not, you know, just at random. Uh, the, the amazing things about human beings is that we, is that we are, are very productive when we try out new things. And the kind of creativity I've got in mind there is the sort of creativity that we see uh, not necessarily in Picasso or Mozart or, or Einstein, but the sort of creativity that, that uh, even children um, uh, exhibit when... For example, uh, uh, they, they muck around with Lego bricks and make some new kind of structure, or they draw some weird, weird uh, thing on a piece of paper. Uh, you know, children are incredibly creative, and they're not going to be uh, uh, you know, earning Nobel Prizes or, uh, or you know, winning composition competitions with that kind of creativity, but that's at the root of the, a child's ability to learn the wide variety of, of, of uh, capabilities that we need, which in turn is what enables us to learn all the kinds of different jobs and invent the new kinds of different careers and, 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 and so on that we, that we have, that kind of creativity. Now, we don't know how to endow computers or robots with those kinds of things. And there's a, there's a third one, that I, a third C that I, that I uh, often cite that I should have a slide for these days, which is abstract concepts or concepts, so the, the, uh, which is related to these two things. So the ability to comprehend and apply uh, concepts and uh, abstract concepts. How that links into these two things, again, would require a kind of like, uh, you know, a sort of 10 minutes by itself. But. Okay, so, um, so there are various, now, just because um, we don't know how to overcome those obstacles and create human level artificial intelligence, and just because People have been working at that kind of thing for decades and, uh, and, 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 and haven't achieved it. And just because uh, you know, there's no sign of, of, of us knowing how to overcome those obstacles now doesn't mean to say it's never going to be done. So I think there are, you know, I, often, um, I often see two kinds of mistakes which are made in the media or kind of uh, perpetuated by, by the media. And one is to, th to think that this kind of human level AI is just around the corner and it's gonna lead to some kind of you know, utopia or some kind of, or it's all gonna take over and it's just around the corner so we need to panic or feel thrilled or whatever now. No, it's not around the corner. And that's one mistake. But the other opposite mistake is to think it's never going to happen. It's completely impossible. We could never build something that's, that's, that is, has the same intelligence as a, as a human being. And I think that is, that's equally misguided. I think it's certainly, there's nothing um, to prevent us in principle from building an artifact that has a, a level of intelligence that matches that of a human being eventually. But we don't know how to do it yet. And there are a number of ways that we can try and approach that. We can try and engineer things from scratch, or we can try and copy the brain. So that's certainly one way, a sort of brute, more brute force way that you might try and do this, is to copy the human brain, which is, which is a physical artifact that we know is capable of human level intelligence by, by definition. Or we could do a bit of, bit of both. But the important thing, just to reiterate, is to be clear about the time scale and uncertainty. And I'm sorry that, that this is on the bottom of the slide, so, 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 uh, so a lot of you are not seeing the really important bits, which are the dates. And um, so this is sort of, uh, if asked when we're going to achieve human level AI, you've got to, you, you know, which, which uh, you know, you've got to make something up, right? So this is the kind of stuff I make up when I'm asked to predict when we're going to make, when we're going to uh, achieve human level AI. I say, well, I think in the next 10 years or so, we're going to have specialist AI um, the kind of thing that I talked, was talking about earlier on, it's going to have significant uh, economic impact. And that's very likely, near certainty. But from sort of 2025 to 2050, well, you know, maybe we'll start making, who knows when one of those conceptual breakthroughs may, may be made to do with creativity and so on. So 2025 
to, to, to 2050. Well, human level AI, I think it is possible, but still unlikely. 2050 to 2100, well, human level AI, increasingly likely, but still not certain. So this is my, my kind of time scale. Um, uh, that's the sort of answer to that question. Okay. Um, now, here's a, a, another little theme that often arises in this, in this uh, context, that of superintelligence. And, uh, and indeed, uh, of course, Nick Bostrom's book, which uh, some of you will be familiar with, is called Superintelligence. And, in, and indeed, there isn't just... So now we're well into the uh, realm of, of distant, you know, long-term speculation. And that's the important thing to preface this discussion with. It's long-term speculation. But just suppose we did manage to make human-level artificial intelligence, the kind of thing we see in science fiction films. Well, the interesting thing then is that, well, there's no reason to suppose that humans are the pinnacle of intelligence, are the, are the sort of the limits of what is possible in terms of intelligence. And indeed, a human-level AI, which isn't constrained by biology, could be made smarter in a number of very straightforward ways. So first of all, we can imagine, depending on how we've constructed it, simply accelerating it. So simply making the thing that we've built work faster. We can also parallelize it. We can make lots of these things um, and perhaps make them all work faster. Um, we can also do some sort of simple uh, things that we can't do to real brains but would be much easier to do to an artificial brain in a, in a, bio, in a you know, silicon substrate. We can, for example, just increase its memory capacity. So there are a number of very straightforward ways that once we built human-level AI, uh, uh, that is uh, built something that is liberated from biological constraints, then there, there are some very simple and straightforward ways in which we could make it smarter than human level intelligence, superhuman level intelligence, or super intelligent. And there are also, there's the possibility of so called recursive self improvement. So we can also envisage that, well, one of the things that a human level AI is certainly going to be capable of doing is making a human level AI, because we're humans and we just did it, right, according to the, this, this hypothesis. Um, so that means to say that the human level AI can make human level AIs, and indeed it could make AIs that are a little bit smarter than itself. And that should mean that, it's able, that those AIs, its successors, are able to make even smarter AIs and they're in turn able to make even smarter AIs. And so according to one way of thinking, this would lead to a so-called so intelligence explosion, a very rapid, potentially very rapid increase in the, in the intelligence of these, these things. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why this might not happen, why, this might, why, why uh, there might be caps on, on, on this, uh, this possibility. But what, I what I'm pretty confident about is that, uh, is that if we did build human-level AI, these simple ways of, of uh, making it smarter than humans are, are going to, you know, they definitely are going to work. Whether you would get this kind of intelligence explosion, there are all kinds of counter-arguments uh, uh, to that, but, but certainly I do think that once you get to human-level AI, you would get to superhuman-level AI pretty quickly just by these, using these sort of simple uh, 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 methods. Okay, now. So now this brings us on to the... Uh, onto the, uh, the whole Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk uh, um, theme of how it's going to be, be the end of us all. And, and uh, so before I go into this, I want to just emphasize, because, because then what happens now is what happens is that, that, that then there's a reporter from some tabloid newspaper who then only looks at this slide, and then, uh, then, then there's some headline that says, um, uh, it says, you know, uh, AI researcher from uh, Imperial College says that the end of the world is nigh, right? <laughs> no, you know, there was like a whole load of stuff about how we might not be able to do this. There are all kinds of conceptual obstacles. It's not around the corner. It's a long time away and, and so on. So please bear in mind all of those caveats. And what I'm throwing at you is not a little tiny celebrity soundbite without any context. I'm sure you appreciate that, right? Um, now, so what I want to talk about is here is the arguments that some authors, notably uh, Nick Bostrom uh, uh, in Oxford and Eliezer Yudkowsky, have put forward for why, if we do build this kind of superhuman level AI, it is potentially uh, dangerous if we get it wrong. Okay? And, the, uh, and so why some people call this an existential threat. And this is the kind of thing that was alarming 
Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and led them to, to issue their celebrity sound bites. Um, uh, so the argument, which is just an argument and might be wrong, okay, but the argument uh, uh, is, it goes along these lines. And the first thing to, to say is that it's very, very important not to anthropomorphize the kind of AI that we might build, not to assume that it's going to be human-like. Just because it's a human-level AI doesn't mean to say that it's going to be a human-like AI. And indeed, the kind of AI that... Uh, that concerns these authors is one that is not remotely human-like because what it does is it just optimizes some uh, reward function or some goal or, or, or tries to achieve some goal that it's given and it's just extremely, you know, brutally efficient at doing that and very, very smart and does that very, very, very well. And so uh, a nice, um, and you know, there are various little analogies to, the, to this. So the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where, as you recall, um, in, the, in, the, in the little story that Disney uh, animated so nicely, then the Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, you know, wishes that, uh, that he could be relieved of the duty of, of fetching water. So he casts some spell and says, and says oh, you know, well, I, well, who, I don't know exactly what he says. I'm not going to try and make up a Mickey Mouse spell. Um, but uh, he wishes that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that, you know, that, that the the water could be brought for him. And of course what happens then is that, is that then these sort of um, uh, brooms get animated and bring tons and tons and tons of water. You've all seen it, right? And, uh, right? and, 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 and these buckets of water keep coming until there's floods everywhere and, 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 you know, and, he, and he can't stop it, right? And so this is the kind of concern that people have about uh, this kind of super intelligent AI, that we may fail to specify exactly what we want and we get what we asked for in a literal sense, and uh, there are all kinds of disagreeable side effects that we hadn't anticipated. Um, so uh, uh, another example is the, the, you know, the King Midas story, where he wishes that everything he touched turned to gold, and you, he soon, pretty soon realizes that actually that was a bad idea, you know, but doesn't realize it until it's too late, and uh, 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 you know, he gets exactly what he wished for, but uh, his wish was not uh, you know, expressed in quite the right, the right way. Um, so the concern here is that we might build a very, very intelligent AI that, is like, that has the same kind of flaw in it. And the example that um, uh, Nick Bostrom uses is this paperclip maximizer. So suppose that some company... How much, how much time have I got now? I'm nearly at the end. Are you kidding? Okay. Uh, but, it's, but it's very interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll finish in two then. Okay. So this paperclip maximizer. So the idea is that is that some co company wishes, or, or not wishes, it asks the AI because this isn't magic. This is real. It asks the AI to uh, make its paperclip manufacturing more efficient. It's a stationary company. All it does is it just makes it makes stationary, right? But what this AI then does is it proceeds to 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 gradually. Uh, accumulate more and more resources, it builds more and more paperclip factories until basically the whole world gradually turns into paperclip factories and nobody knows how to stop it um, and it keeps on, keeps on going. Now, you might think that that sounds silly, right? And all I can say is that in order to convince yourself that there is a case to be answered there, you really need to read their arguments and not just dismiss it as silly out of hand. So, uh, so indeed, there are counter arguments to why you, this, might, this kind of thing may not be a worry and all kinds of ways we might address this concern, but you do really have to read the arguments of these authors to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, you know, to, before you dismiss it. Okay, so I'm going to finish now. So this is my concluding uh, question Q&A. Are we about to build human-level AI? Well, probably not within 10 years. Will we ever build human-level AI? Probably within 100 years, I would say. What will it be like? Will it be human-like or not? Well, we really don't know, but we can speculate in an informed way. And will it be safe? Well, maybe or maybe not. So what should we do? So we really need to start thinking about these issues right now. So I'll stop there. Then. Thank you. So I think we should bring all the panelists back up on stage.